So I hope you hear me okay today because my, uh, my voice is not too good for some reason. So to move to the third and fourth Arupa jhanas, um, we have to recollect the characteristics of the previous jhanas, particularly the ones we talked about last week, the first and second. Always the same principle. To move to the next um, level, we have to be fairly clear about the previous one that we're coming from. So the comments that some people made last week when they emerged from their practice were very helpful to give a, a sense of what actually each person ten, might experience. So I'll use those as a way of recollecting the first and second Arupajana. One person mentioned how their practice uh, seemed to shift between the first and second Arupajana, um, between infinite space and infinite consciousness, seemingly um, involuntarily, backwards and forwards, more than once anyway. Another person commented that um, after a while, the two jhanas tended to merge. So what was it, the beginning, an exploration of infinite space, um, tended to shift even by itself, again, apparently involuntarily, I'll say apparently, to infinite consciousness. And finally, infinite consciousness became almost the, for that person, the default. Another person was aware that there was a certain hesitation, a certain wariness or reluctance to let go of familiar anchors, to let go of Rupa world. And then getting a little bit more confidence, nudging it a bit and gradually playing with that boundary, letting go of Rupa to move into our Rupa takes a bit of uh, getting familiar with. And then more than one person were struck once they got into the practice that it could be quite tricky to emerge, almost as though getting into the Arupa realm became, one or two people described it as almost a magnetic um, attraction. And to get out or end the practice needed quite a lot of kind of care and delicate um, care to re-establish connection to the to the body and to the to the world. <coughs> now, if you think back to when we talked about Rupa Jhana, particularly it would have been in the second talk where we were talking about the first Rupa Jhana. This is quite similar in the sense that you have to get used to something new. In the case of Rupa Jhana, it was getting used to the transition from sensory consciousness into towards jhana consciousness, letting go of thinking in particular. And at that point, several people commented, they, they noticed the tendency to touch on something very still, and then to the urge to kind of reflect on it, a kind of checking, a kind of checking to in a way, uh, check up, they're still there. And the same thing with the Arupajana, there's a tendency to check where we are. And the, the Arupajanas are even more strange than the, the Rupajanas. You know, the, the whole idea of um, letting go of boundaries uh, the idea of a, a limitless or boundaryless state or an infinite state is very, very strange to conceptualize. It takes time to get used to. And so it's therefore completely normal that at the beginning we, we can't just move straight into our Upachana. There has to be some kind of exploration of the of the boundary, just like there was with Rupa Jhana. 
and the getting used to is is essential. In fact, all the comments where people were talking about the um, the effects of moving between the Rupa and Arupa, uh, sorry, between the first and second Arupa jhanas, in some cases, one or two people, this gave rise to images, uh, trying again, trying to put some kind of um, conceptualization onto the experience. One person mentioned a sense of flying in the infinite space experience. Another, per and I think the same person mentioned something about a, a, a kind of limitless three-dimensional ocean in trying to establish infinite consciousness. So these are, these are all explorations around the boundary until we get a bit more familiar with it. And actually, the fact that people could express those um, experiences around the boundary is saying something very important, that there's a, there's a capacity already to hold the experience, then slightly withdraw and reflect on it without being pulled back into sensory consciousness or too crude thinking. And without some experience of the Rupa Jhanas before, that would be impossible, actually. So <clears throat> the comments that came up last week are very um, encouraging, actually, that even something as difficult as starting to move towards an experience which is completely out of our normal realm of experience is possible. And playing with that boundary is, is part of developing it. So eventually, as you practice and repeat different sittings, gradually it becomes a little bit more normal, not unlike riding a bicycle. And the comments that some people had of finding it or a reluctance to leave the experience is a, again an indication that it's approaching um, absorption. And the fact that those comments came up, the reluctance to leave it, again is not surprising because I was asking people to practice and then come out of the practice directly into the stillness not to come out progressively through the other jhanas and eventually back to sensory consciousness. That's quite a challenge. And of course, most of the people listening to these talks are experienced. But if you were teaching a class, then you would, you would be more careful. So that pull to um, stay longer or to find it difficult to move too quickly back into engagement with the world is, is partly the way we were practicing online, exactly because I wanted people to stay with the experience in order to be able to express uh, what it felt like, the insights that may come up. But in your own practice, then <clears throat> you, would, you would practice differently. You would make a <clears throat> determination to to practice for a certain length of time and then emerge. And on emerging, you would stay with the experience as long as you liked, depending on circumstances. Um, maybe demands in the, in the house cause you to limit that time. But if you're on a retreat or there was no one to um, take into account, you may stay as long as you like until finally your instinct or your um, mind-body gradually, naturally wants to emerge. So last time we're talking about the first two Arupajanas. Akasa Angsha Yatana and Vinyana Angsha Yatana. And if you again think back to when we're talking about the Rupa Jhanas, the parallel 
with, for example, the first and second Rupa jhana, jhanas, was that they were very closely connected. It was all about attention, getting familiar with attention and eventually bring it under some control. And in the two first Arupa jhanas, infinite space and infinite consciousness, they were talking about last time that they also are very interconnected. And you could say that they are all about getting familiar or exploring the subject-object relationship, Nama Rupa, again, that we live within in our consciousness. And in thinking about that, how it's done in the first and second Arupa jhanas, it's an incredibly clever technique It allows us to, by making each position, the object position of space and the subject position of the consciousness of it, by allowing the boundaries to gradually expand more and more towards boundlessness or infinite, that in it requires us to actually identify totally with each pole. We become the object pole, as though we're flying into infinite space and becoming part of it. Hence the comments someone made last week about flying. And I remember when, when Nibruman first started to talk about the Arupa Jhanas, um, and the first occasion I think he talked about the infinite space experience. He made uh, some similar comment about showing back people how to go into outer space. You know, what is outer space like? And you have to go into it to experience what it's like. So getting used to this technique and moving between the, the two poles in either direction, it becomes clear to the meditator that at first it seems that when you're experiencing infinite space, that's all there is. It gradually becomes clear, almost like a not thinking, but there's a kind of awareness or direct knowledge that somewhere there has to be the counterpart of consciousness. But we're not identified with it. And the same with the infinite consciousness, somewhere there has to be a counterpart of an object, infinite space. But somehow with this technique, it's as though we've separated them. As though we, we've, the previous process where they're rolling on subject, object, and the object becomes the subject of the next moment of consciousness, the next, each, each subject, object, rolls on to become a, a new subject object, but they're interconnected. And within sensory consciousness, that effectively never stops. But in this, in this process, the Arupa Jhanas, it allows meditators to get a sense of each position, which then weakens our attachment to the whole process. Realizing that they're interconnected is the way the first two Arupajanas develop. The meditator comes to the point of realizing that, that there's somehow a interrelatedness, that there becomes a, an urge to move forwards, to free, to free oneself from even that interrelating this. And that takes us to the to the third Arupajana. So the third Arupajana is called the, the sphere of nothingness. Akinchana Yatana. Akincha is an interesting example of the use of the character A that I mentioned last week. Kincha is something. 
a kinsha is not something or nothing. But it's not exactly nothing, it's not something. And the fourth one, which we'll come back to later, sphere of neither perception nor non-perception. I'll leave that for the minute. But the sphere of nothingness, how do we develop that? So for example, rather like the progression through any of the sequence of jhanas, the meditator would develop the first and then the second narrow pajamas. And then having established the intention before practice to go further, would momentarily emerge from the second narrow pajana and determine aditana or choose very, very subtle intention to re-enter the formless experience and to mentally take up a position in between, not identifying or being pulled towards the object pole, the previous infinite consciousness, and also not being pulled to any kind of self-consciousness or infinite consciousness. So I think I said that the wrong way around. Not being pulled towards the object pole of infinite space, and also not being pulled towards self-consciousness or the pull of infinite consciousness, but holding something in between. A very fine balance. And that is the third Arupa Jhana. There's no subject and there's no object. What kind of consciousness is that? You know, normally we're familiar that we're conscious of something to be conscious. If we're not, if there isn't anything to be conscious of, how do we know we're conscious? So this, this third Arupajana is, is very subtle, really challenges our, our ideas of, of consciousness. And again, it's something you can't really conceptualize. So in re-entering with the intention or aditana to hold that position in the middle, a bit of extra help may be needed, like we, we did with the first and second Arupajana, and to use the, the syllables for nothing or not something, akincha, as an invocation. So the meditator re-entering practice after practicing the first and second Harupajana would very subtly intone or use the syllables akincha, nothing, with the intention that when the last syllable, last sound comes to an end, akincha, at the end of that last a, uh, the intention is okasa, let it be manifest, nothing. To help the meditator hold that position, no intention of going anywhere, to either becoming the subject or the object. <clears throat> but yet the meditator is still conscious And you realize that this, well, probably before this point, that the Aru Pajanas are all to do with exploring not just the subject object relationship, Nama Rupa, but the whole nature of consciousness itself and perception. And I want to say something about consciousness here. There's a sort of background because I think most meditators inevitably um, become aware and very curious about, you know, at this point, who am I? Because all the usual anchors that define who I am, not just the thinking, 
that we usually have, familiar objects. But even the sense of um, Paul Denison, you know, or, or Charles King, or whoever you're used to thinking of yourself. In the era of pajamas, all that's gone. Also, all the sense of wanting or not wanting, in, in the crude sense of liking and disliking, those feelings are also gone. So a natural curiosity comes out about consciousness. On the one hand, in Buddhist practice, you know, the motivation to develop jhanas is ultimately to understand craving and detachment as the roots of suffering and to free ourselves to some degree from suffering. But in doing that, in developing the jhanas, it's, it's almost like a, a research laboratory, you know, into all these subtle ideas of consciousness that people have held a curiosity about, who am I, for thousands of years. And then you turn to modern neuroscience, who only in the last few decades, by looking at the workings in the, in the brain, are also trying to understand what is consciousness, what is attention, what is feeling? How do they all relate to who we, who we are? And the two converge. When the research study into meditation was going on, um, it took a little while to realize that there was a parallel movement in neuroscience, quite a lot of it in London, actually, in exploring exactly the same kind of problems, but using different um, conceptualizations. <clears throat> and when it got to the point of publishing that paper and dealing with the huge resistance to the ideas, you know, the idea, the, the study just demonstrated that there is um, a possibility of withdrawing from sensory consciousness into jhana consciousness, that the networks in the brain are quite different. In sensory consciousness, the underpinning subject-object relationship seem to be related to a linkage between the front and back of the brain, where the, the back of the brain, which is the visual con cortex, the part that deals with sight or seeing carries the kind of subject pole of not just the I, E, Y, E, but also the I, I am seeing. Then the object pole was mostly carried by the frontal part of the brain, which does a lot of the cognitive processing. Whereas in the shift to jhana consciousness, the vertical axis between brain and body developed. <clears throat> now, some of the researchers in neuroscience slowly, slowly became very intrigued by this. The paper now, by the way, has reached over 10,000 reads worldwide. So, and that's, I think, someone tells me in the top 5% of all research papers in the last 10 years in neuroscience. But yet people are still not sure exactly what it means, how to position it. So they, the neuroscience development, I want to try to ex explain a little bit about this because it's like a parallel understanding of the Buddhist model. So this is the, the neuroscience model of how an individual engages with the world. And the theory behind it is a very interesting theory called the free energy theory, which says that every organism is self-organizing if it's going to survive. It always has a boundary between an inner part and an outer, <coughs> from even from a cell right up to a human being. 
So in the case of a human being, the outer world engages with us through sensory input, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, and then touch from the body, but also a lot of other information from the body, what's called the interoceptive information from the nervous system. Now, mostly unconscious, but an awareness of the condition of the body, the sympathetic, parasympathetic system, and the internal organs, the balance of adrenaline and cortisone and so on. All that is the input. And the input, the current situation, resonates with all the things in memory, held in memory of prior experience, whether it's short-term or long-term memory. And the two together, inputs and their relation to past experience, lead to a lot of processing, very, very fast processing in the brain, mostly unconscious. Coming out of that processing emerge various options for action. Many, many, many. All mediated by what would they feel like? Would they be good for the organism? Would they lead to past painful experiences or pleasant experiences? So that at some point, a choice is made. And that choice then becomes part of prior experience. That action becomes part of the experiences held in feeling memories. So the choice updates the prior experiences, which then leads to, with new inputs in the next moment, to new predictions for action, all of which again are evaluated to make a choice and the process goes round and round and round. What this doesn't show is who's, who's driving this process. Mathematically, and this originally this was a mathematical theory. And in the mathematical theory, there is a direction mm. forward to maintain the organism existence. And the direction forward protects the organism and sets up a workable interchange between the organism, ourselves and the environment. If there isn't a way forward to do that, it's because it's called a self-organizing principle, then eventually everything would degenerate into into chaos and be taken over by, by a breakdown of entropy. So there has to be a direction. In other words, there has to be something that keeps an eye on this choice of action, the implications. In other words, an agent. And the theory stops short of saying, um, what does this mean in terms of a person? But it's a very intriguing parallel between the neuroscience view and the Buddhist view that there is a, an agent or a sense of I doing this, which emerges in neuroscience from the mathematics. You know, the, the agent has to be some parallel to our self-consciousness. But most neuroscientists stop short of saying this is self-consciousness. This is the arousal, this is the origin of consciousness. Because again, you then end up in limitation of words. What does this actually mean? And how does it transfer into me feeling I am doing something or I am? So, you know, you might argue that in the, in the neuroscience model, the mathematical model, that it's not unlike a computer, that the, the organism is just like a computer, is simply executing a program. Um, otherwise, you would say that a computer has consciousness. But then the computer, someone has to implement the program. So in both cases, you come back to the agent being so close to what we assume to be the I as the driver. And then, of course, in mathematics, you could say this is illusory. 
In Buddhism also, Buddhism says this is, this is also illusory. It depends on conditions arising and passing, arising and passing. And so the, the constant updating of the neuroscience model is not unlike the constant series of subject-object moments in the Buddhist view of consciousness, which now in the Arupajanas were dismantling. And that's a kind of laboratory you can't create in a, in a, in a science lab. You know, this is a laboratory of someone sitting in meditation, you, ourselves, which is a, quite, quite a remarkable thought, actually. Practices which go back, you know, over 2,000 years, shedding insights into this which cannot be directly approached by any other way. So in the first and second Nehru Pajama, it gives the meditator a sense of holding either a subject position or an object position which in terms of the neuroscience self-organizing model stops the process dead. The whole sequence of unfolding subject, object, subject, object effectively stops at that point. And we have a, a moment, some moments of experience in what it's like to be just in one position a self position, a subject position, or quite different, an object position, with no limit. And then in the third Arupa Jhana, the meditator goes further by effectively stepping back one more, one step more, from the whole process of subject object. There's a similarity here, which um, I don't think is the time today to go into it, to what it feels like in meditation is almost like the position in the third Arupa Jhana is rather like holding everything still. The moment of consciousness becomes so still that it, it's as though it doesn't split into either taking a subject or becoming self-conscious. And it's very difficult for me to put words on to trying to conceptualize or think about the fourth Arupajana, but what I, what I would say is maybe it's like at that point the meditator gets used to the middle position being free for a while of the subject object, everything in a very, very fine balance. Rather similar in a way to the fourth Rupa Jhana, very, very fine balance, but without limits. And this is, I believe, the point where it's as though the meditator has stepped back to the ultimate threshold of perception. How far can you step back from that subject object world? What can you let go of without disappearing, without becoming unconscious, without dying ultimately? What would, what would that be like? And that I would suggest is the kind of um, aditana or the kind of direction towards the fourth Arupa Jhana. So the fourth Arupa Jhana, the sphere of neither perception nor non-perception, is trying to capture, the words are trying to capture that moment where a meditator has stepped back from the subject object Nama Rupa process to a position where there is neither perception, neva sanya, neva neither perception. Na, the N apostrophe is nor asanya, neither sanya 
nor asanya. So neither perception nor asanya, non-perception. It's not perception, but it's also not non-perception. What does that mean? And the invocation here might be simply neither nor, neither na, neither nor, with the intention that that kind of opens up something to the fourth Arupajana. Basically also the meditator may have the intention in going into this practice before sitting to let go of anything remaining, anything which we take as I or I am, and see what, see how far basically you can go. What's left? Will we become unconscious? Or what kind of consciousness will remain? So I think that's the kind of limits, for me anyway, of whatever words um, I can put on this. So let's, we practice for a while. And as like last week, when you come out of the practice, stay with the stillness. And then if something comes to mind you want to voice, then please do so without worrying whether it's relevant or not. And for a while, no need for anyone to respond. Just to hear what the comments might be. So I'll sound a bell to start the practice. Then I will sound a second bell. Let me just think this through. When I sound the first bell to start the practice, Recollect what you did last week. Fairly quickly, recollect the first and second Arupajana. Infinite space, infinite consciousness. When I sound the second bell, move to the third Arupajana, nothingness, akincha. Akincha, know something. And when I sound the third bell, move to the fourth arrow of Vajana. Basically, simply step back, let go of anything that constitutes your assumptions of yourself. I can assure you, I can assure you, you, you won't die. And then the final bell to end practice. Okay. So, begin practice. Um, I don't think I am. Um followed the instructions properly and I therefore spent most of my time um, in the third and fourth jhanas, uh, Arupa jhanas. <clears throat> and um, I kept going from one to the other. They seemed to work together um, and it, for most of, a lot of the time, I felt in an absolutely amazing place which um, was just how it didn't seem to have any boundaries it was very light it was very still and it came to my mind that um, that's how I would like to die in that in that state um, because it was so it was so safe and so um, so beautiful Mm. Every time I, a thought came, then I noticed a sort of messiness and I had to put my attention back on either 
the third or the fourth. Um, anyway, uh, it was it was very nice. And whether you can hear me, can you? Yes. 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 Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, I just I, unfortunately I wasn't here last week, um, but the recollection of the first two Rupa Jhanas, I found today uh, that infinite space on the in-breath and infinite consciousness on the out-breath seem to be a way of playing with the boundaries which Paul expressed before. And I, the other thing is that uh, for me, <clears throat> until the Pali becomes more familiar, I find saying no thing is actually in English uh, one of the best ways of uh, of doing that. Mm. Um, and if, just finally, I may have to leave the meeting before time because uh, it's an hour later where I am, and uh, we were expecting people for lunch. So apologies mm -hmm. if I disappear suddenly. Disappear. Paul, I was exploring the. Um, I guess because I got a lot to the bells and. Um, the move from the third arupa to the fourth arupa and maybe because rob has given me this responsibility today to record something something kind of crystallized i kind of noticed that more clearly that in that amazingly peaceful state of the third arupa jhana and then the, almost like a question arose okay so what is the to be let go of at that point, what, what remains? And I kind of noticed a um, very subtle wish within me to almost to, re to remain registering my experience. Or, I mean, the analogy is like recording. There was there's a very subtle wish to continue not quite knowing. It's almost like registering. It's like and it's very close to existing. It's as if a moment of fear that if I stop registering what I'm experiencing, then I will stop existing. And that wish to continue registering, I could let go of that. And I think that was, the, from today was clear, the kind of the entry into something different, which I guess I think of as the fourth Arupa, where even the wish to experience or to register as experience or to it's gone. It's it's as if it doesn't matter any you know, it's it's not important anymore. Uh, yeah. and yet I'm you know, I'm clearly not dead. Um, so that was very interesting. But it's also very relevant to what Marcia said. You're both talking about the same thing. That point which is very, very close to what we'll all experience at some point about what is, what will death, you know, mean. And um, you know, in, in both cases, you're touching on something in the fourth Arupa Jhana, which is very relevant to that question. Can I say something? Yeah. Um, I found in the um, fourth Arupa Jhana that um, just felt a really um, uh, a strong sense of opening, just an opening, <laughs> um, sort of you know right from the centre, and um, and it's almost that a sort of it's almost that that then my <laughs> something else kicked in of like, oh, you know, that, that I became conscious of the opening and yeah, it's like, that's too, <laughs> it's too much. <laughs> and um, so it was interesting. And just when I um, felt a very supreme reluctance to come back actually at the end of the practice. And I just, I just, when I opened my eyes, it was, um, I was just looking at the cornflower on my shrine and the, the blue, the color just seemed almost overwhelmingly blue, almost sort of painfully blue. Yeah, anyway. 
Claire, did you say you wanted to say something? Yeah, j just to say it. Yeah, I found the experience very, very light. Very light and kind of amusing. <laughs> you know, just, you know, if there's no, no thing, no perception, no non-perception, you know, there's, there's, there's nothing, nothing to worry about. <laughs> you know, as for, you know, the sense of self, just not really there. But the whole, the whole thing was light and subtle and, and each one increasingly more subtle and, and lighter. And uh, so it's sort of, sort of fragile in that, you know, that, that, yeah, just, so it sort of came and went, but uh, yeah, that's, that's all I want to say. Yeah. Uh, so first I recollected the first and second jhana, and when I entered the third, it became darkness for, for some time, and then it cleared in the fourth, a sort of suspended lightness till I finished, just lightness and in a balance state. That's what I experienced. Mm. I can't understand the darkness part of the third one. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Um, yes, I, I um, it took a while. We needed that time beforehand to go. For, I was glad of the bell to make a, a, a definite sort of stronger intention but I did find that whatever place it was very similar to the way Marjorie described it felt very free um, and no need to try any anymore you know I had that quality of I wouldn't say ease but lightness but also freedom you know and it was um, a comfortable freedom actually um, and and I let myself go. Let, I didn't have to think about myself too much. Uh, it was a certain quality that um, was was quite lovely, um, rather like Marjorie's description. But then I found it. I found a bit of uncertainty when the bell went to the next one. I just couldn't quite uh, be sure sure enough where to go from there. Um, what the difference was. Um, so I just sort of, in a sense, tried to maintain, but I couldn't get quite the clarity of freedom. Mm. The other thing I noticed at the end, I pulled the blind right down. And when, when I slowly, as said, came and opened that white blind, seemed to, to be it. It had a quality of it. In fact, even when I remember it, because it's translucent, but behind it is a whole lot of stuff going on. But the blind um, whiteness, not too white, um, just thinking of that seemed to, to go with the practice somehow. Um, so it's going to be a bit of an aid, I think, <laughs> in the future <laughs> to have the blind down. Hmm. Mary? Yeah, um, I've kind of, I haven't been coming to these meetings, so I went in cold and had not had contact with the Arupas. So uh, I, I recollected um, probably the first Arupa practice with um, a, a week with um, Manai Bhuman or the experience of it, just sort of being absolutely um, stunned. Uh, I could, you know, didn't know where I was and absolutely stunned and, and, and another experience of um, I think it was touching on the second and I, I think the contact with that was very, very strong. And then I probably spent the next 10, 15 minutes working through something until it kind of coalesced to, Oh, I'm working with the subject object pull and something became purified as it's like the contact was there. I, something was brought into being and then, and then very, very strongly. And then I had to work through something because there was, um, where I was and what that was, there was um, a kind of gap and I, 
eventually it kind of became um, a working through of sub from a very, very strong sense of the subject object pull and something just shifting. Like um, uh, every time I noticed I was caught in something, it just shifted and, and um, shifted again, um, became, uh, I guess, sent more sense of space, more sense of um, becoming bigger and bigger. And then the, on the third one, just letting all that go um, and just, just dropping it and, um, uh, you know, dropping that sense of working between the poles and then something kind of deepening and purifying. And then wherever, what, whatever that was, letting go of that and then something sort of purifying even more. It's just sort of the, the, pro, the process I found quite interesting. Um. Um, yeah, the, it felt like um, a sense of relief. That was the, the main feeling. Um, but going from the first to Arupas, they felt very spacious then into the, um, the third and fourth, it felt like something was becoming smaller almost, and that everything was a bit like things were happening in the heart. Um, and like for Santa, there was a sense of darkness, but it, it wasn't really darkness, it was maybe just the absence of the light, I guess. Um, and what was quite interesting and the, the overwhelming feeling was was of peacefulness and this, just a sense of great relief almost. Um, but what I found quite interesting was a moment when um, I was aware of the body and the breath, but somehow they didn't seem to have anything to do with me. <laughs> it was just something going on that I didn't seem involved. That was an interesting, very pleasant, interesting, not even pleasant. <laughs> Not sure of the words. <laughs> a relief. <laughs> yes, like many of the comments, that that sort of quality. The thing I was perhaps most aware of was deep, deep silence. Just deep silence and uh, when we finished actually the thing that just came to mind which is would not be something for me that would come to mind normally completely outside of my uh, normal habits was deep clean <laughs> it was like a deep clean <laughs> don't know where that came from but it 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 just caught that quality but yeah yes like like a lot of people i felt a, quite a, a lot of um deep peace but what, what i was really curious about is when i came out of the practice and looked at my hands I was just really surprised that they were there. It just seemed like I was quite, well, surprised is probably not strong enough. It was, it was quite, quite, um, yeah, just, just, I've got hands, uh, which just, that's all I want to say, really. Last time, um, there, there was quite a lot of discussion of the uh, fourth Rupa Jhana. Uh, not Aru, but Rupajana is something held, H-E-L-D. And uh, I felt that the in the um, Arupas, it's like a kind of exploration of unholding, of somehow not holding. But then there's this real uh, thing at the in the fourth one, the fourth Arupa. Um, you know, if a thought comes or something comes, anything comes, uh, Where's it coming from? What's, what is the holding? What's the, the thing that's, that's, that's somehow um, still tying us? And it does seem very relevant to what Marjorie said about, um, about death. Because in a, if, if you go into um, lifetimes, into, 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 a, into, as it were, the long stream, then this is almost like the opportunity, the possibility for breaking something for cutting something, 
or cleaning. And so somehow that's what, what's in, came to mind in the practice. Sort of following on a bit from the last two comments, um, actually your diagram that you showed is the neuroscience model. What came up for me was the, in the Abhidhamma, the thought process that um, it was a beautiful description of the thought process that, uh, that there was, and you talked about it being unconscious and there's sort of, and people have mentioned vibrating and reverberating or words like that and registering. Uh, it, there, it, there was something about that in, in the middle, I can't remember the diagram now, but in the middle, that next to the head, there, there's something in the middle there. And, then, and where the arrows were, it reminded me of the Javana process where Kama comes into it. So it's almost as though there's a really unconscious registering going on in the middle. And mm. then, then the Javana, the Kama process, what we do with it coming in, and which was and the, just somehow or other going into the, going through the Arupas, what I became aware of in third was actually almost, I think of Thich Nhat Hanh and deep listening, somebody has mentioned the word deep. It was something like having to, just letting go of normal processes in order to be able to contact and understand uh, what was going on. And in the fourth one, actually what came up when I reflected on it afterwards, this is the first verse of the Dhammapada, um, mind is the forerunner of all things. That, And actually there's something about that fourth. It struck me that it's the, the beginnings of the thought process come <laughs> sort of linked in there at some point, somehow, I don't know how. <laughs> there's not much I can add to all these comments. <laughs> It's almost like the Arupa Jhanas are you know, the creator, uh, the creator kind of potential space for insight to come up very, very readily. There's hardly need for me to, to say much to add to that. Um, everything people have been saying is. Um, kind of beautiful illustrations of all the different factors that come up for different people at different times in these practices. And the different feel of the Arupa jhanas compared to the Rupa jhanas as much very free, free of the burden, you know, free of the burden that we carry all the time in just living and keeping going our engagement with the world. About Paul? Yes. Um, can I just say something? <laughs> yes, you can. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I wasn't going to. Um, <clears throat> I felt deeply moved and very uh, humbled and grateful for being part of this whole process and being with sharing it with others. Um, very, very touched, as other people said and started to feel the heart opening, like Sarah was saying. And then I just thought just now that I did have a dream this morning, and all it was was mm. a voice was saying very clearly to me, why are you worrying so much about your future when you haven't dealt with your past? And that's all it said. And then other people saying their comments, as if in some way doing this practice is working through your past somehow, purifying what's, what's happened before or trying to clear out and, and, and clean, um, you know, the, the long history of all the positive, all the negatives and so on, and, and facing that, actually facing it and, ha and letting a space appear for you know, a certain amount of trauma to, to, to be there, you don't really understand it, and then face it, um, face your fears. What have you got to be fear, fearful of? And being free could be just finally letting go of all the fears that you have and all those things that you bury because you're frightened to face them. And so 
allowing yourself to become more and more free within um, a huge, enormous space that you realize you know this tiny speck in this enormous cosmos <laughs> and um yeah that was it it's also um interesting that we've come to a point in the sixth talk where the last one is going to be somehow um, saying something about the past. But in a way, the comments you've been making are, are right up to almost um, leading right into that. You know, the, the sense of time also and space. We talked about the uh, infinite space. But the reason I keep forgetting the, the bell is because in the in the Arupajanas, the two go together, and which is why I like the um, it's why I like the wax taper practice because you can completely let go of any idea of of time and not have to worry about sounding a bell for me. And when the weight drops, there's a very quick break in the stream of consciousness to move to the next stage. So talking about the Aru Pajanas, and it's, it's, an, it's a collective experience in these talks, which is just unfolding is I guess why the idea of um, not just infinite space or letting go of those boundaries, but the in inevitably, if you're going to let go of the boundary of um, the space limits, you have to also let go of um, our normal sense of time. And thinking of that diagram that Rosie mentioned about the neuroscience model, um, is coming to a point where stepping right outside that process. And so this is why we, we, we haven't been getting many bells in these talks. And that's okay. And someone, I think it was Rosie. I think it was Rosie mentioned something about um, the uh, the kind of thought process and the beginning of a thought where does it come from someone else also wondered where does it come from and the stream of karma but the the fourth and the 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 threshold of perception perception is the point where we are able we become a subject and so the fourth Arupajana is stepping back to the, the just the very threshold of perception, um, neither perceiving, but also not perceiving, not not perceiving, neither perceiving nor not not perceiving, nor not perceiving. is something like letting go of that whole process of becoming, which is why this is almost impressively what we talk about next week with the, with the path. So the, the Arupajanas are quite magical. You know, they're so different in one, one sense. The third Arupajana that we've been talking about today, you know, nothingness. Um, Someone who's probably left the meeting now mentioned that he quite likes using the word no thing. And he said no thing rather than nothing. And that's exactly the, exactly right. You know, the akincha doesn't mean nothing. It means not something. 
So, so nothing doesn't exist without something. You have to have a kinsha, something, before you turn it into nothing. So without something, there's no nothing. So the, the third Arupajana is not a black hole. The girl, one or two people mention it can get quite dark. And that's right, but some people, when you let go at that point, it can become quite dark. It doesn't have to. And it could be the absence of light, as someone said, the same person said. This is the way our internal perception works in very subtle ways to try to grasp the experience. So the Arupajanas, you know, you practice them today and then maybe in your own practice. And there's no point in hanging on to it's going to be like this or that. And I think most of the comments people are making, are, everyone is to some degree realizing that. It's letting go of those expectations, boundaries, limits. <coughs> quite different to our, quite different to Rupa, the held state, much freer. And if you let go of all the 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 um, what what's gone before which I think is quite right to say that that thread goes right back into our karma. Then the, the phrase in the transcendental jhana chant of establishing jhana for the dispersal of karma, you realize this is actually real, that it is possible to experience without any fear and then to let go of those links. That thread that one or two people are talking about will become very interesting. You know, keep it at the back of your mind when you practice before next week. Because the, the distinction between jhana and when it becomes path is as fine as that. And it can happen at any time. I was just wondering if I could, um, I don't know if this is a relevant point to bring it in. At the end of the practice, when I opened my eyes, what, and, and other people have alluded to this in different ways, there was, what struck me, I was practicing facing through some French windows, to my, so I've got my garden in front of me, with lots of trees and things. And as I opened my eyes, what struck me was that, um, almost like I could see every single leaf on every single tree blowing in the wind and, and stuff going on in nature. But the, the sort of the multiplicity of it, the impact of that was, was very dramatic. And, and what occurred to me, and this is where I, there seems to be a little bit of a connection here, was the kind of the alongsideness of the multiplicity with the empty space that it, it's it's like they're not separate from each other somehow some something like that yeah. um and we have this tendency don't we to, to make things dual well there's yeah. the silence and the emptiness on the one hand and there's you know the multiplicity of the world on the other but it's as though there's a long sideness and interdependence mm. between them, as though both are there, even when the attention may be on the other, potentially. Mm. Just that, yeah. Something along those lines is what I just wanted to point to that came up for me. Yeah. I think that's right. And I think it, it's good you articulated it, because I, I suspect that we're all aware of it to some extent, but it's slightly different to our normal experience. You know, take what I just said about the, the third Arupajana, the idea of what does something mean and what does nothing mean or not something. Our habit, our instinct is to imagine um, there's something and there's nothing, almost like a linear process. Well, it's actually taking what you're saying, you could imagine maybe something much more um, 
like something become could be infinite space all encompassing just becomes all encompassing infinite consciousness or nothing so rather than be linear or here and there you said binary you know it, it is much more a kind of situation of um, just three-dimensional space or even four-dimensional space much more fluid the boundaries become much more fluid and i noticed them when people practice at green street and they're practicing outside they have exactly the same experience you're talking about particularly in their rupa jhanas that they often coming out of practice rather than noticing one particular uh, object typically a flower um, or the movement of a tree the experience is much more, as you described it, much more all-encompassing. And this again is different to trying to home in and fix a rupa, a particular rupa. So yeah, that's an interesting um, comment to first reflect on. I must admit, sometimes I, I struggle with the whole kind of letting go and what that means and and for me actually with these practices a bit like what Izzy was saying it, it almost helps me to try and really make as much of something as I can um, and that kind of naturally allows me to let go and it, it's almost like maybe another way of thinking of letting go is to kind of really give give to something you don't know what you're giving to but you just keep giving as much of yourself as you can and for me there's a kind of connection between Rupa and a Rupa, and rather than trying to sort of push away body and feeling, it's actually um, sort of acknowledge them as fully as I can. So, not trying to push away feeling, and and it seems to me like I I, I almost need that sense of it's it's the kind of feeling on a subtle level that lets me know where I am and whether it's working. Because if I if there isn't feeling, then what else is there as a kind of reference point? And and everyone seems today to be talking a lot about kinds of feeling it's not the kind of normal everyday feeling but it's still something that kind of gives us confidence and it almost goes back to the point Paul was making of that kind of invocation there's a kind of feeling behind that there's an intention but somehow that that kind of giving giving to something seems quite important and that's that's what allows me to kind of almost take my kind of guts and my heart into that um, practice as well as just the kind of mental um, understanding of it. Mm. I think that's probably quite a good point to, to end on. So I'm going to um, sign out and hopefully see you next week. Okay. Thank you for all the comments. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Thank you.